Nobody, but nobody messes with the Borgias. They are the original crime family. Rodrigo Borgia is the godfather. Don't be fooled oh. by the Pope hat. <laughs> he's savage, he's vicious, he's shocked by nothing. Daughter Lucrezia is beautiful, calculating and loves an orgy. She was a wicked, conniving poisoner. And San Cesare is your worst nightmare. He is even more ruthless, even more cruel than his father. <laughs> Get in their way and you'll be poisoned at dinner. <laughs> and take a midnight dip in the Tiber. Murder and debauchery were pretty much the order of the day in Renaissance Italy. Welcome to the secret life of the Borgias. <laughs> Rodrigo Borgia, mobster Pope. This guy can hear your confession or beat one out of you. Rodrigo Borgia is possibly the most notorious pope who's ever lived. He's top dog in the 15th century Catholic Church and Mr. Big in history's original crime family, the dreaded Borgias. When Mario Puzo was looking for inspiration for The Godfather, he looked back to the Borgias because they are the most ruthless criminal family of the lot. And Rodrigo's rap sheet would shock even Don Corleone. Collectively, he and his family have become a byword for murder, for incest, for poisoning, for debauchery. <laughs> and good old-fashioned lust. Papal celibacy? Forget about it. He ignores the fine print, keeps mistresses all over Rome, and sires who knows how many bastard kids. He definitely had nine illegitimate children. He definitely had innumerable mistresses, including a couple of teenage ones. He boasts of his mistresses. He shows them off. There's no hiding. There's no sense of shame. There's no sense that this is a sin. It was absolutely um, the rule that the, the clergy couldn't marry and was certainly not supposed to um, engage in any form of sexual intercourse. Uh, this didn't stop any of them. They were all at it. Girls, boys, sisters, brothers, orgies. It was all going on in the Vatican. A fresco in the Borgia Palace depicts His Holiness kneeling in adoration before the Madonna. But that's no Madonna, that's his teenage hoe. This was considered so heretical, so scandalous to have, you know, the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, represented by this underage slut that in 1655, a subsequent pope had it destroyed. Even by the standards of popes of the time, he is seen as outrageous. <laughs> he calls himself Pope Alexander, named not after the pious third century martyr, but after Alexander the Great, the bloodthirsty Macedonian conqueror. He's that kind of guy. It's quite difficult for us to understand quite how powerful the Pope was. He was pretty much the boss of everyone. During his papacy from 1492 until 1503, he turns the Vatican into his personal ATM machine. His stock in trade is what's called simony, the selling of papal appointments to the highest bidder. And he would happily grant anybody a cardinal's hat as long as they'd pay him for it. Everything's for sale, including an ongoing door crasher special called Papal Indulgences. They're express passes to the pearly gates. Sinners snap them up like lottery tickets. Basically, it was a piece of paper on which the Pope wrote, I absolve you from all your sins. You will go straight to heaven without passing go. And you, you paid the Pope, you know, whatever he wanted for it. All in all, the Pope thing is a gold mine. His Holiness is pulling in millions. He is very, very rich indeed. He's up there with Warren Buffett. And he loves to show it off. The Borgias were not discreet about anything. Rodrigo wears his wealth on his back. He wore cloth of gold, which is actually made of spirals of gold with silk thread through it. He's like a feudal king who then has people under him in a kind of pyramid. Get in his way and he won't slap you around or slam your head into a pizza oven. Oh no, you, my friend, will be sleeping with the fishes. Rodrigo will kill people who come in the way of his success. 
or the success of his children. There's no convenient Tony Soprano style landfill. The Tiber River in the dead of night is his dumping ground. This is where the 15th century Romans dumped their garbage. And this is where the Borgias got rid of their garbage, the bodies, and there were plenty of them. The Venetian ambassador, scared out of his wits, writes to the Doge in Venice. Every night, four or five men are discovered assassinated, bishops, prelates, and others, so that all Rome trembles for fear of being murdered. And every morning, like the newspaper landing on the porch, they bob up near the Castel Sant'Angelo, a message from the Borgias. The corpses were bound, gagged, and bagged, then stuffed into a wooden cage designed to patch on the banks of the river. The message was clear, don't mess with the Borgias. And the mobster Pope has another weapon, charm. He's brilliant, witty, and brimming with animal magnetism. At his core, he might be rotten, but his external front is something that people warm to. I think Rodrigo Borgia was sexy in the way that mature men who, who are sort of stocky and powerful can be attractive. He fills the Borgia Palace with fine art, but he's not highbrow 24-7. Rodrigo also appreciates the lesser things in life, like kicking back with his daughter Lucrezia and watching horses have sex. How do we know? Because of this guy, Johannes Bacardus, the Pope's faithful Austrian scribe, who wrote it all down. Four stallions jumped upon the mares and covered them, tearing and hurting them severely. The Pope stood together with Donna Lucrezia and both looked down at what was going on there with loud laughter and much pleasure. Today, Rodrigo might be watching Trash TV. No surprise given his upbringing. The Borgia family were accused of being provincial nobodies. They came from the, the wild hills of Spain in the middle of nowhere. Basically, they're a pack of hillbillies on the make. So how does a guy with a mistress, a bunch of casual girlfriends and bastard kids get to be Pope? Rodrigo has handy connections. His uncle is Pope Calixtus III, and he takes care of family. Rodrigo makes cardinal by the age of 25. And he's also made vice chancellor of the church, which means that he has almost as much power as the pope, and more importantly, he holds the purse strings. The cardinals are all jostling for power and control. The one with the quickest wit and the most money wins. The Vatican, 1492. Pope Innocent VIII gets sick, <laughs> conveniently dies, and Rodrigo makes his move. At this stage in history, it's pretty routine to try and bribe the College of Cardinals to vote for you. Rodrigo buys off the cardinal who holds the deciding vote with 30 mule loads of silver and is thus elected pope at the age of 61. And then the shenanigans kick into high gear. The Vatican. Rodrigo Borgia, now Pope Alexander VI, has Cardinal Orsini over for dinner and uncorks the special wine. Orsini will be dead in four days, poisoned. An invitation to dinner with the Borgias was not perhaps the invitation that you really wanted to accept. If you reach for the wrong jug of wine, it might be curtains for you. The Borgias are famous for their poisoning. And the Borgias have it down to a science. They keep a chemist on staff to brew up the lethal potions, testing them on cats, monkeys, and disposable mm. servants. They use Cantorea, which we think is white arsenic. And arsenic involves a terrible death. You have a burning sensation in your throat. It's been described as feeling like a fireball in your stomach, like you're burning up from the inside out. And then eventually you'll die. And it can take anything from two hours to 10 days. Orsini gets the slow version, giving Alexander time to be somewhere else when the Cardinal finally succumbs. And the wonderful thing about poison, you see, is that no one knows he's actually done it. You could have just eaten something terrible the night before and be feeling a little bit sick and, oh, they die. Uh, you know, they were fine when they came to dinner, uh, but apparently they're not the next day, so the Borgias. This guy's like a comic book villain, hell-bent on ruling the world. He wants to create a great unified state in Italy for his dynasty to rule. And he's really the first person to have come up with this idea. Italy isn't a country yet. 
It's a collection of fractious, warring city-states. Rodrigo has Rome and wants to bring all of them together under his control. In order to do that, he had to make sure that they were providing him with the armed support that he needed. He makes his son Juan head of the army, arranges strategic marriages for daughter Lucrezia, and appoints son Cesare cardinal and his hitman. Cesare is the family consigliere. He is even more ruthless, even more cruel than his father. Tony has Sil, Rodrigo <laughs> has Cesare, and he's pure evil. <laughs> he takes everything that Rodrigo has done to another level, but what he particularly does is get rid of the enemies of the Borgias. Cesare's never without his hired muscle, who wear tunics bearing his name in silver letters. When you see them coming, it's curtains. Machiavelli uses him in The Prince as an example of a man who will do nothing, will stop at nothing, whatever immorality it involves, to get the ends he wants. With Rodrigo pulling the strings, Cesare and his thugs produce a steady supply of bodies for the Tiber. On Thursday, the 9th of June, 1502, there was found in the Tiber, strangled with a crossbow around his neck, a man of about 18 years. There were also found two young people bound to each other by the arms, the one 15 years of age, the other 25 years, and with them a woman and many others. Cesare has a short fuse. The merest slight can incite his wrath. Like the rude note about Rodrigo that somebody unwisely posts on a statue. And the Pope just laughed this off. Cesare took it much more seriously. Cesare finds out who did it, cuts out his tongue, lops off his ears, and hangs them in his window as a not-so-subtle warning to others. These are supreme acts of terror. He's making everybody scared of their family. June 1497, another body pops up in the Tiber. This time, it's Rodrigo's firstborn son and Cesare's older brother, Juan. Rodrigo launches an investigation, but calls it off when the evidence points to Cesare as the killer. His brother had something he wanted. He was the head of the papal army. And we know from later accounts that Cesare doesn't stop at anything to get what he wants. The murder of his brother, in a curious way, was, was what made him a Borgia. It was, in a sense, his initiation right, you know, like being a made man in the Mafia. In this screwed-up family, killing your brother seems to be the right move. The Pope gives Cesare what he wants, head of the army. The Sopranos would be shocked. This seems to draw father and son close together into an alliance which lasts until Rodrigo's death, which is a pretty peculiar reaction for a fratricide. Lucrezia Borgia, Rodrigo's little girl, is smoking hot, spoiled rotten, and has a very bad reputation. The popular perception of Lucrezia is that she was a wicked, conniving poisoner. Sexually debauched, a murderess who willingly committed incest with her brother and her father. That she was an adulteress of the First Order. She has that beautiful outward appearance, but she's also known for her inward rot. So, pretty lurid. <laughs> The sins of the Borgias are all laid at Lucrezia's elegant feet, whether she committed them or not, making her one of history's most feared, reviled and notorious bad girls. Lucrezia was reportedly very beautiful. She's described as having an elegant neck and very white teeth and a fine nose and pale, beautiful eyes. She's described by one ambassador as being so graceful that when she's walking, she hardly looks as if she's moving. Lucrezia needed to look good for her father in order to be a political asset for him, and we know she took ages to get ready in the morning. Starting with the hair. To get it looking really good, she applies a mixture of ashes, saffron, and something else. Stale urine. Stale urine? So I'm afraid this does smell pretty much as, as bad as you think it's going to. Oh, it really does, doesn't it? Where did they get the urine? The urine of a boy child was preferred. This is partly for ease of collection. <laughs> right now, I want to know if she had a little boy on staff just for the fact she wanted to dye her hair. And once we've boiled that up and straightened it, that will give us a bright yellow liquid. When we apply it to the hair, it's going to break down the colour molecules in her hair shaft itself so that when she goes into the sun, bleaching can happen. And we're going to damp her hair down 
Yeah, the sun will act as a natural bleach. The saffron will add a little additional golden glint all of its own. Lucrezia was really famous for having wonderful white skin and pale eyes and lovely red cheeks. So she obviously spent a lot of time and effort investing in being that Renaissance beauty that would attract men's attention. And it definitely worked. I think that's damp enough at the moment. We'll need to revisit it in an hour, but for the moment, Lucrezia can relax and we just need to make sure that she doesn't pick up a tan while we're at it. A paper mask protects her skin. Thing is, she doesn't want to get a tan because obviously having a tan is terribly unattractive, it's just that you work. And one of the things that she doesn't do is work. And she's more than just a beauty queen. She's known for her intellect, her culture, her ability to speak different languages. She learns Italian, Spanish, French, Latin and Greek, along with public speaking, music and poetry. She can write poetry in five languages. She's bright and accomplished. February 1493, Daddy marries her off to Giovanni Sforza, the rich and influential Lord of Pizarro. But political alliances shift, and soon the Pope wants Sforza out of the picture. The Pope decided that the marriage should be annulled on the grounds of non-consummation. The fact that Lucrezia was seven months pregnant at the time did nothing to deter the Pope from declaring his daughter a virgin. Rodrigo bullies Sforza into confessing he's impotent and then lines up husband number two, a Neapolitan prince, Alfonso of Aragon. They are a good match and they do fall in love. They have a little boy together, Rodrigo, um, and they do seem to be extremely happy. But within two years, Daddy is once again plotting and scheming. When Lucrezia's second husband was deemed no longer serviceable to Borgia foreign policy, Cesare rushed into their bedroom, pulled his sister out, and had his henchmen stab her husband to death, practically in front of her eyes. Lucrezia doesn't take it well, but the day after the funeral, Cesare visits her, and it's as if nothing had happened. It was given out that he died of some kind of terrible illness, but of course everyone, including Lucrezia, knew the truth. And yet somehow that didn't seem to affect relations in the family at all. Lucrezia is very close to big brother Cesare and daddy Rodrigo. Some say a little too close. What on earth is going on? <laughs> Truth or rumour? Lucrezia's getting it on with her father. The stories about incest come from the accusation by her first husband originally that the Pope wants her all to himself. So that's the first suggestion that she's actually having an affair with her father. And could it be it's not just daddy she's doing, but her brother too? Whether they do the deed or not, they have a relationship that is intensely passionate. The sort of love that you don't expect to see between a brother and sister. I think it's possible that there was an incestuous relationship there. The Borgias are absolutely impossible to understand from modern psychological perspectives. Verdict, maybe. Truth or rumour? Lucrezia was as big a poisoner as her brother Cesare. It was said she even had a special poison ring with a flip top, a little arsenic at dinner, and a slow, agonizing death for dessert. So it seems to be true, but. Absolute nonsense. Poison rings um, are a kind of opera prop of, of Borgia legend. It's false. Truth or rumour, Lucrezia loves an orgy. There was a thin line between orgy and party. Then, as now, Bunga Bunga ruled the day in Rome. One day in particular, famously called the Banquet of the Chestnuts. On the evening of the last day of October, 1501, Cesare Borgia arranged a banquet in his chambers in the Vatican with 50 honest prostitutes who danced, at first in their clothes, but then naked. And chestnuts were strewn around, which the naked courtesans picked up, creeping on hands and knees, while the Pope, Cesare, and his sister Lucrezia looked on. This is a bit like the things you hear that Thai girls do with ping pong balls without being too indiscreet. If this isn't enough, there's a competition staged by the Pope and by Lucrezia to see who among the churchmen can have sex the most times with the prostitutes. And this is done, the account says, in public in that room. And 
There is a prize given to the person who does it the best and the most times. True. Lucrezia is a total party animal, but has to tone it down when Rodrigo sets up her next marriage to Alfonso d'Este. He's from one of the richest families in Italy. Her duty in life was to marry where they told her to marry in order to enhance their worldly ambitions. Lucrezia gives up her party girl ways, has a whole pile of kids with Deste, and as always, Rodrigo Borgia gets his way. But then, disaster. Rome, 1503. Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. Pope Alexander VI, and his villainous son Cesare have come down with something after dining at a cardinal's palace. There always has been this story that the idea was to poison the cardinal and that they got poisoned themselves instead. And they were soon sick as dogs, feverish and vomiting. It is 99.9% .9 certain that what they both contracted was a very severe form of malaria. Cesare recovers, but not Rodrigo. August 1503, Pope Alexander VI, the Borgia godfather, dies <coughs> at the age of 73. It's not pretty. Because of the hot weather and the lack of refrigeration, the body begins to putrefy very quickly. It fills up with gases. It turned black. It bloated up so that it was nearly as broad as it was long. The porters kind of stuffed it into a coffin using sticks, crushing this bloated, putrid flesh into the coffin. He looked completely spotted, the nose swollen, the mouth quite large, the tongue swollen up, doubled so that it started out of the lips, the mouth open. In short, so horrible that no one ever saw anything similar or declared to know of it. So much for Rodrigo. Some might say he had it coming. Cesare gets his four years later. He's handed over to the Spanish as a prisoner and carted off to Navarre, never to be seen in Italy again. Lucrezia moves to Ferrara, where she dies in 1519 at the age of 39, after her 15th pregnancy. The party animal had become a baby factory. <laughs> I think that they've given us a picture of the dark side of the Renaissance that we like to embrace. What the borders are, most of all, is dangerously sexy. That sense of them still carries through to today. They were debauched, they were depraved, but when you hear about them, there's still something that is intriguing. Rodrigo is not the first pope to be involved in conspiracy to murder. He was not the first pope to have illegitimate children. He was not the first pope to steal estates and give them to his family. I suppose what makes the Borgias exceptional is that they did it so well.